Look, it's clear, based on my YouTube analytics, people are watching my steam bending videos. So I wanted to create a timeline to show the progression from learning how to use the technique all the way to implementing it in a relatively complex build. If you are thinking of getting into steam bending, this video is a comprehensive guide with pretty much everything you need to know about it. I've also included some previously unseen footage and you'll see why I didn't include that in the original video. And I've mixed that in with some of my older video clips. Okay, so let's get into this. Hi everyone, my name is Robin Lewis and in this video I'm going to be having a go at steam bending. We start off our journey with a very green and unprepared steam bender. So the first thing I need is a steam box, that's where the wood goes into to get it up to temperature and to make that box I'm going to be using some of this pine. The reason I've put in so many screws along this length is as I fill this with steam this box is going to want to warp and twist like crazy. The problem with that is then the steam's going to escape and you're not going to be able to get the temperature that you want. You may be thinking plywood would have been the better option and I think it would have, but I had this pine left over from another project and I figured with enough screws, I'd be able to get away with it. And I did. While solid wood isn't ideal, all it needs is to hold pressure. Pretty much anything can do that, but how often it can do that over and over again, that's the issue. Another popular option, according to YouTube, is PVC, but my results with that were well, I didn't actually get a result. I never included this next footage in the original video because it stretched the runtime too far, but a wood box wasn't actually my first attempt at creating a steam box. Well, the first test is done, and unfortunately, this has not worked out <laughs> basically at all. There's just not enough steam coming through, so while the, the front end of this pipe is it's really hot, as you come down two meters away, it's now pretty cold. Little did I know that getting enough steam into that pipe wasn't actually going to be the issue. So what I need to do is find a bigger vessel with a bigger opening so I can pump more steam in quicker. And then that way I should be able to warm up this entire two meter long tube a bit more efficiently. I plugged in my steam cleaner just to see what would happen if I had good steam in the pipe. And I read that 60 degrees Celsius is probably where PVC pipe gives in and <laughs> I could say conclusively that that is absolutely true. You can see at the end there, it's just starting to sag. If I run it for too long, the whole pipe just buckles and, and squashes in on itself. So really this is not the way. Just to give credit, I have seen people do it. So it does work. My only thought is that I was using DWV drain waste vent PVC pipe, which might be thinner than pressure pipe. So if I'd switched to something thicker, maybe it would have worked, but it was at this point that I decided to just put PVC aside. With that failure out of the way, it brings us back to where we are, building a solid wood box. I screwed the back panel in place and then started working on the front panel this needed to open and close. I used some fairly cheap window seal as a gasket and then attached the front panel using a hinge and a clasp. The idea here is you want the seal to be as tight as possible so you have better control over the steam, but if it does leak a little bit, it's not the end of the world. Ultimately, you want the steam to flow through the box from one end to the other, so it doesn't need to be completely tight. However, if there's too many gaps, then it's not going to be able to build up that warmth like you want it to. The next step is going to be to get steam into the box and you would normally use something like a proper steamer or steam unit. I don't have one of those, but I do have a steam cleaner. So what I'm going to do is drill a hole roughly the size of this and then I should be able to slide this in and then that just holds in place as the steam is coming out. Then I drilled a few holes to allow the steam out. What you don't want is the box building up too much pressure and then that was it. Okay, so the steam box is ready to go. I've just got to add some steam and then we can get underway with the first and hopefully last test before getting onto the bending of the chair. <laughs> you can see here I changed where the steam enters the box. This was just to help it spread through a little more evenly. You also want to tilt your box up so that the steam rises up through the box and then all the excess water will run back down through one of those holes. This is where having a thermometer helps so much because you can see exactly when your box reaches the magic 100 degrees Celsius. It's amazing how as we're getting closer to that 100 mark, it's struggling, it's really struggling to get 
any hotter. 97. <laughs> Come on. While that's busy steaming, I apologize about the hiss. Let me talk to you about the form that I'm going to be using. This is just a straight piece of timber with two um, half circles. So the idea is going to be to clamp it along this and then curve it around. All I'm doing in this test is making sure that I can curve this radius. In the meantime, we just peaked 100 on this. So it's dropped back down to 99, but just took a little bit of time. We're up to about 20 minutes now, and this did get up to 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, here we go. You want to be as quick as you can with this process because as soon as that wood leaves that high temperature, the lignin is going to start solidifying again. Okay, well, that didn't work. Okay, let's go to plan B. Let's see what I can do with this. Okay, that did not work. It's day two, I've done a lot of research last night and I think I may have found some answers to the problems I was having. This is the timber that I've been using up till now. This is Tasmanian oak and according to a very good document, which I'll link to, this should be good for bending. So I'm not too worried about the wood that I'm using, but I think the thickness might be where I'm falling down. This is six mil thickness, which I would have thought would have easily bent. But re-watching a lot of the videos, I see people going down to four, even three millimeters, and then they have success. So that's the first thing I'm gonna to try today. I'm gonna to resaw some of this down to around three or four millimeter, and we'll try and bend that. Okay, we're up to 90 degrees. The new timber's going in. I'm gonna try and be a little bit more precise with this one, so get it to a specific temperature, keep it in for a certain amount of time, that kind of thing, so that I know when I come to do the actual project that I wanna do, I've figured out where that sweet spot is. While the wood's cooking, I've been making a new form as well. I suspect the old form that I had might have had a radius that was too tight, so I'm gonna try going a bit bigger and then work my way down to that. So this is a fairly larger radius, and then I'll be able to clamp the, the piece of wood on either side of this. Something that really started to make sense with this test is the amount of pressure that you need to apply to get the wood to bend. It's not too quick, it's not too slow, but you sort of start to figure this out around this point. It went further than last time. Definitely went further than last time. So I do feel like I am making some progress. I've had it running now for another half an hour. So I'm gonna pull it out in a couple minutes and have another go. So I'm gonna try and be a bit quicker with this one. Not happy. Can I just say, watching this back is so frustrating. If you got this far into the video, thank you. I promise I do eventually figure it out. But this is hard to watch. Oh, it's gonna go, it's gonna go, it's gonna go. <laughs> uh, I need more support around the outside. That's what I need to do next. I'm starting to think that the combination of a wider radius and thinner strips is definitely working. But the next thing I'm going to try is using a strap for the outside of the timber. So the idea is, as the, the wood is bent around the form, this is going to support those, those fibers on the outside. So I'm just waiting for the box to heat up again, and then we'll give it another go. Okay, so... If you're wondering, this fabric came from a ratchet yeah. strap set. A better option would be to use some kind of flexible steel, but I didn't have any of that. This is what I had on hand. 
Okay, there's still a small crack. I don't think I've done it perfectly, but along this top edge, it, look, it looks like it's held together. So I'm gonna leave this, let this cool down, see if it holds its shape. But either way, progress is definitely being made. It's been about 12 hours. The lignin in this wood should hopefully have dried in this time. Uh, as you can see, I'm getting a bit of spring back, but it should be closer to its shape. All right, I'm pretty happy with that. Got a bit of cracking over here. But that's it really. And that's holding its shape. The thing with it is though, even though now it's, it's sprung back, you can still push it back in and it's relatively flexible on that point. This is a win. I'm, I thought there was gonna be a lot more cracking in that. Good morning everybody, it is day three and this piece of timber has been sitting overnight submerged in water. So its moisture content is up to 28%. It's probably a bit too high. You really want it between 20 and 25%, but I wanna see how this affects the result. Well, that didn't make a huge amount of difference. I've still got another nice big crack right there. Um, I guess it's, hmm. I wonder if it's just gonna come down to time in the steamer. But that's cool. I think this crack is minimal enough that I'm happy to proceed because as long as one of my bends is correct on the actual project, then I would be happy because that'll be the outside one and that'll be covered. It's the next day, so this has been sitting in the form now for almost 24 hours. This is the longest I've kept it in the form for. The other one I brought out a lot sooner. It's interesting, I've left this one in the form for a lot longer and I'm getting a lot less spring back than this previous one. You can see there, it's a lot tighter. I've read that you're supposed to keep it in the form for at least 24 hours, and that's obviously why it just reduces that amount of spring back. All right, I'm gonna leave this project here. I'm feeling pretty confident now that I should be able to bend wood in the actual project, which will be in a later video. I've gone from this, which was probably a bit more breaking than bending, to this final bend over here, which I'm, I'm really happy with, a little bit of sanding and I reckon that would be good to go. So just a couple of things, if you are thinking about doing this to yourself, just a couple of points that um, I've figured out along the way that you might be interested in. The first one is that the one hour per inch of thickness rule, definitely a guideline. Um, I was steaming this for an hour and that got me to where I wanted. And this is obviously a lot less than one inch of thickness. This is four mil. But that hour worked with this particular species of wood. So when they talk about an hour of, of steaming per, per inch of thickness, I think it's really dependent on the wood. But because you're new and you're not sure how to do that, you've got no real idea of what is and isn't going to work. So my advice, just steam anything around this thickness for an hour and start with that as a baseline. And then from there, you can either bring it back or do it longer. The other thing is that I would highly, highly recommend you go for a wood that is easily and readily available. This Tasmanian oak or Vic Ash is 
Uh, I can buy this from my local big box store. So I've always got a supply of it and you are going to make multiple mistakes. You are going to end up with a pile of breaks. So if you have a type of wood that you can get on demand and it's always the same type of wood, that's gonna work so much better for those initial stages. Instead of going for your exotic one of a kind piece of uh, timber that you wanna bend and you're just gonna break it. All right, well, that was a, well, it, was, it was a journey. <laughs> um, I'm gonna be using what I learned here to make a chair, a bent lamination chair, and that'll be coming up in a future video. But I hope you got something out of this. Um, if you haven't done bent lamination before, this is what you can expect. Um, so I hope you've got a little bit of information out of it. My name is Robin Lewis. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. And if you wanna keep up to date with this type of content, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe and hit that bell icon. All right, everyone, take care, and I'll see you in the next video. So at this stage, I was feeling cautiously optimistic. That last bend technically was a bend, but it was nowhere near consistent and smooth enough to be used in fine furniture. But it was close enough, and I wanted to use the technique in a real-world scenario, so I jumped in. And on a side note, this next project is still my favorite project, personally, of everything that I've built. Hi everyone, my name is Robin Lewis and in this video I had a go at steam bending and chair building. Two things that I have never tried before, so it was a lot of fun, I learned a lot. Hopefully this video is going to be some inspiration to you, if not at least give you some ideas on building a chair of your own. Alright, with that said, let's get into it. I'm going to start by creating the form for steam bending the legs. This is made up of three 16 millimeter MDF panels. Once those have been glued together, I can draw the 200 mil radius and create the shape. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the steaming and bending process. I did that in my previous video, which I'll link to, and there are heaps of resources out there about that. But all I'm doing here is creating a form, giving it some holes for the clamps to fit through, and then smoothing it off so that the wood flows and bends around it as easily as possible. The majority of this project is going to be made using Tasmanian oak, which is a very pale blonde timber. To add a bit of contrast, I'm using this piece of recycled, what I think is Moreton Bay ash. I got this off a building site and they used to use this quite a lot in the building practice. So I'll cut this down, create a few strips of it, and then I can inlay this between the Tasmanian oak. This wood was incredibly dry, so I put it into the steam box for a couple days and just lightly steamed it to try and bring the moisture content up and try and make it more supple. And while that was going on, I could get down to cutting the Tasmanian oak into thin strips. Okay, so all of the strips have been milled down to thickness. They're at three millimeters, which is a bit thinner than the test that I did, so these should bend really nicely. There's gonna be nine of them in a stack. So this is a nice big, chunky piece that you're gonna end up with. Okay, well there's nothing left but to get this timber over into the steamer. Um, this is where it all becomes very uh, real. Up until this point, I'd put in a lot of work into milling those boards down. And once they come out of the steamer, you only have minutes to get it onto the form. So this was a very, very tense process. All right, 80 degrees at 132. This is a good time to jump in and talk about my then upgraded steamer rig. I used this wallpaper steamer permanently from then on, and it was great. My only concern was that the water reservoir was a bit small, so mid-steam, I'd have to quickly go and fill it up with water and come back. This didn't affect the outcome, but during that run to the tap to fill it up with water and come back, the temperature would drop from 100 down to 80, which just meant I had to steam it for longer. So if you are looking for a steamer or something to steam with, try and get the biggest reservoir possible, whatever that is, and it will make the whole process a lot smoother. This first bend went fine, but this was the first time I'd properly got the timber up to temperature. So you can see my fingers really struggling here because the timber is so hot. In the second bend, I put on gloves, which made a huge difference, but I also used a strap around the, the strips. This not only improved the bend, but it also improved the, the process. It sped it up, which is really important. You want to get these bends as quickly as possible as they come out of the steam. 
I've let this timber cool now for a couple of hours, so the next step is gonna to be to put wood glue in between and laminate them together. This is basically gonna be the same process as the steam bending. I'll take them off the form, put glue in between, bring them back onto the form and clamp them in place. I wanna point out that all of this wood is kiln dried as opposed to the much better bending air dried. But one of the goals of this project is I wanted to use wood that was easily accessible and readily available. So all of the wood in this project has come from my local home center. Yes, air dried timber will bend better, but you can still bend kiln dried. Once the glue on the legs had dried, I took it out of the form and then used a router jig to flatten one face. The next thing I want to do is parallel this face with this face. I am really happy with that result. Oh, this is gonna look so good when it's done. Then I simply repeated the process to create another leg. After that, I moved on to the slats, and as a contrasting piece, I'm gonna be using some Merbau decking. So there'll be three strips, Tasmanian oak on either side with Merbau running through the middle. For this form, I'm gonna be using pine, and I start by cutting it so I can get a 100 degree angle from the horizontal up to the vertical. This is a standard angle for chairs. You'll also notice I've made two forms and that's gonna make a bit more sense later on. I wanna jump in here and point out the wear on this box. Earlier I said solid wood will work, but here we are halfway into my first project and you can see the strain that that box is taking. If you're only doing one steaming project, doesn't matter, go ahead with solid wood, it'll work. But if you do wanna do this more permanently and have a box that lasts, have a look at form ply. Adding that stop block at the front of the form was hugely important because later on, when it comes time to glue these slats in place, that point, that front of the slat is gonna be my reference point so all of the slats will line up. That is a successful, successful first bend. 10 more to go. <laughs> I've taken that first bend off the mold. Now we're gonna move it onto a second mold. It's an identical mold. And this is where I'm gonna do the glue up. And then this can sit in the form, in the, the glue up form overnight while I get back to steaming. And after all that, I'm left with a bunch of these strips. There's 11 of them. In hindsight, if I'd been a bit smarter, I would have made a number of forms. That would have sped up the process quite significantly. But the, the thought behind having only the one form was that I'd have a much better chance of making sure that all of these strips, all of these laminations are exactly the same. The next thing I'm gonna do is space these slats out. So I need to, that's a terrible picture. Okay, so if you imagine this is a side profile of the chair, I'm gonna be adding three bits of wood, one here towards the top, one further down, and one over here. These are going to split the slats evenly, but they're also going to attach to the rails of the leg assembly later on.
The next thing is to work out the height of the seat. And what I've done in the past, whenever I've made things like stools, is just grab something in the shop, take a seat, and then, oh, hello. That way I can sit, pretend I'm on the chair, get a feel. I might grab a, a two by four, put that underneath. There we go, that's starting to feel a bit better. And then simply take a measurement of that. Before marking out for the mortises, I clamped the two boards together and then marked out both of them at the same time. This just ensures that the mortise is on the same height on both legs. Then I could hog out the majority of the material using a spade bit and then I could cut the inside edges using a router. You'll notice I've got this piece of square stock clamped to the outside of the legs and this is what the router fence is gonna run along. This is just gonna help to ensure that the internal edges of that mortise are flat and perpendicular. The outside of that leg is mostly straight, but it's not as straight as that square stock. Set up the chair and now with the front rail in place I can work out where the back rail is going to be for the slat. And this curve right here, this is what I've got to think about next. This is probably going to be the trickiest bit about attaching the slats. So with this in place you can see that's the angle that I'm shooting for and my first thought was to just take the rail, cut an angle onto it and then sit the slat against the rail. But the problem is then the tenon becomes a lot smaller and to cut that mortise is also quite tricky. So what I'm going to do instead is attach this rail with the full mortise and tenon just below the slat and then between the rail and the slat I'm going to create a triangle piece which will slot in and that's what the slat's going to sit against. I've worked out this angle is 31 degrees so I'll do a couple test cuts first and then I can make a that triangle shaped piece out of some Tasmanian oak. I've cleaned up that angle piece this is ready for glue this will eventually take this strip which will sit against it over there. I've taken the chair apart. This is the back rail that this angled piece is going to sit on. Sit like that and then take this strip like that. Now what I'm going to do next is cut this angled piece to follow this line. Now where it becomes a bit tricky is once I cut that angle and I try and clamp these two together, I'm not going to have opposing angles. So what I did to get around that was add some dowels under this piece over here. Even though that's going to be on an angle and I'm going to be squeezing and it's going to want to slide apart, those dowels are going to hold it together. So the dowels aren't really there for strength, they're just there as locating pins. Okay, here's the plan. I have practiced this glue up a couple times now, so this should work. So these slats, I've clamped one of them on the back here. This one over here gets put in place. These are just being, these two uh, strips are being held in place by clamps and I'm going to be gluing the slats onto each one of these. So I'm only gonna do three at a time, that's so that I can get the clamps in and I'm gonna be clamping to the front and the back strip. Then once I've clamped all of the slats onto these strips, I can then pull the entire assembly away. The glue's finished drying on all of these slats. So the next thing I'm gonna to do to reinforce this, this joint is run a dowel up through the strip into each one of the slats. The main force that I'm trying to combat here is sheer force. And while I have no doubt that wood glue is incredibly strong, this is a cross grain joint. So it's not as strong as a long grain joint. Adding these dowels is just an insurance against the slat slipping, even if it might be a bit overkill. Here I'm gluing on the third and final strip to the top of the assembly, and I'm using those two boards in between just to make sure that the spacing is accurate. Less measuring for me generally means less mistakes. Ooh. 
This is a cut that I wish I'd done differently. At the time, I thought that back bevel was gonna look slick, but unfortunately, when you sit on the chair now, there is this sharp edge cutting into the back of your thighs. It's not a deal breaker, but certainly something I'll do differently in the future. To finish, I used two coats of Danish oil with light sanding in between, and that was it. That brings us to today. So I am incredibly happy with how this one turned out. Except at the time, I hadn't noticed the now glaringly obvious mistake, and you can see it in this picture. Leave a comment down below if you can find it. Right there in the middle of all those slats is one very light pink strip. I'd oriented all the strips so that the tone and color was very similar on the front of the chair. But when I went to bend that strip, for some reason I must have just blanked and bent it in the wrong direction. So what you're seeing there is supposed to be on the back of the chair. So now when you look at it, you see all similar tones except for one which is in the middle which makes it more obvious and now over time the finish and wood has aged in a way that it's now even more obvious. I'll live with it but man that one burns. Obviously there's a lot of things I might change if I was to redo it and there's a couple of mistakes here and there but overall as a first chair super pumped with how it turned out. Just a quick thanks to Joey from King Post Timberworks for sort of giving me that push to try something new and try something different. And I also wanna say a really big thank you to everyone on Instagram who's been leaving just amazingly positive and encouraging messages. It really means a lot when you're trying something new and it's something a little bit outside of your comfort zone. So my name is Robin Lewis. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. And if you wanna see more of these types of videos, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe and click on that bell icon. That'll just make sure that you see new videos as they come out. Thanks again, everyone, and I'll see you in the next one. Come to take a seat as well. Come check what I'm doing. I'm, I'm kind of filming though, and you're really standing in the worst place possible. So do you mind if I carry on? Is that possible? You might need to just move along. Yeah, I, I could see that, but I can't play right now because I'm busy. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Robin Lewis and this is my new dining table. It's the first time I've attempted a round table and whew, learned, <laughs> learned a lot along the way. It's got some cool features on it. On the ends are these steam bent curved strips of solid timber. They're contrasting colors. The lighter one is Vic Ash, the darker one is Morton Bay Ash. The legs use angled mortise and tenons and then over here you've got some significant termite damage which are filled using epoxy. So I am super excited about how this turned out. Let me show you how I made it. Okay, I have a fresh cup of coffee. Let's get into this narration. So if you watched my steam bent chair video, you would have noticed that I had a solid wood steam box. That thing just about exploded by the time I'd finished with it. So the first thing I did for this project was create a new steam box, this time out of plywood. Spoiler alert, it worked so much better than the solid wood, but I guess that's to be expected. One of the improvements that I made to this box was to add small feet on the inside so that when the timber went in, it would get steamed more evenly. Now these are the three Morton Bay ash slabs that I'm going to be using for this project. Two of them are going to be for the strips, one of them is going to be the inside of the circle. So I started by cutting one edge, jointing it, and then I could get all of the strips out of this. From a steam bending point of view, it's interesting to note that this is air dried, not kiln dried. You can see that I've marked out these grain lines on the end grain of the board. This is really important to show me which way I need to bend it. When you bend strips like this after steam bending them, you should bend with the grain orientation. So this board should bend that way so that the, the grain lines curve around. Now this is the contrasting timber that I'm gonna be using. This is Tasmanian oak. This has been bought from the big box store and it's kiln dried. I have bent this in the past, but because I'm gonna be bending it at this thickness, 19 mil, I'm gonna to have to soak this for quite a while and then hopefully that should work fine. 
This was the first time I'd tried soaking timber and it made all the difference. All those issues that I'd had in the first video could have been avoided easily if I just soaked the timber first. Essentially, you're giving the steam something to work with, some moisture to heat up the inside of the timber. This means that it reduces the steam time so getting away with one hour for steaming will work in once you've soaked the timber. But the problem is once it comes off the, the form, you are left with a very wet piece of timber and this can affect your glue ups later on. So keep that in mind. With this chasm <laughs> of a hole, there's no way I'd be able to do this, this pour in one go. If I was to fill it up with epoxy resin now to the top, it would get really hot and it would most likely bleed through that tape because the weight of the epoxy would just pull the tape away from the wood. So a better way to do this, and I got this idea from Macromona, is you just mix up a small amount and get a thin layer across the bottom everywhere. And then once that sets up, that will hold the rest of the layers of epoxy in place. It's been about eight hours and this epoxy pretty solid, it's, it's, it's pretty firm. It's not fully cured, but I can go ahead now and get started on the rest of the pours. At that stage, the epoxy had fully cured, so I pulled off the tape and then I could start making the bending form for the steam bending process. But while I'm doing that, I just want to do a quick plug for the podcast that I co-host with Joey from King Post Timberworks and Brian from Sawdust Bureau. It's called The Shop Stool Podcast. We've interviewed some amazing international guests over the last few weeks. So if you are looking for another woodworking podcast to listen to, one that focuses more on the Australian and Kiwi market, I'd really like to recommend that you check out The Shop Stool Podcast. I'm probably a bit biased, but you know, I think it's pretty good. Back to the bending form, I go to a fair bit of trouble here to get this as smooth and consistent as possible. You don't want any sharp points because that could be where the fibers break and you also don't want any strange undulations that could imprint on the wood. So you want to try and get it as smooth as possible. This round over is for the ratchet straps to come around and then I also drill some holes for some clamps to fit into. Okay, today is the day that I start steaming all of this timber and, and start the bending process. This is incredibly nervous, this moment, because if I get the first one out of the box, try and bend it and it snaps, it's just, it's just like such a bad start to the project. So I'm really crossing fingers that all of this goes well. I'll probably film the first one and then maybe one or two after that, the bends after that, but there are a few of them, so I'm not gonna film all of them. I would steam three strips at a time for two hours at 100 degrees Celsius. And here you can see I'm bending one, but later on I go ahead and up that to two at a time. You can see here as I pull it out the, the curve and it's actually quite a gradual curve. So I might have gone a bit overboard with the, the steam bending process. I probably didn't need to go to so many lengths, but at least I knew it would work. And then once the piece had dried for a couple of hours, I would take it off and put it onto a drying form where it would sit until I needed it. I did all the Morton Bay ash at once, and then once that was done, I moved on to the Tasmanian oak. So again, similar process, but you can see here, I'm bending two at once just to speed things up. And then once the last boards had been steamed, I could just lift the bending forms off, use those as the drying forms, and sit those to one side. So earlier on I talked about one of the Morton Bay ash slabs going into the center of the table. This is some Vic ash which is going to be the contrasting color. So I'm building up the slab here so it comes in at around 300 mil wide. With both of my two internal slabs ready to go, I cut a straight edge on the Morton Bay ash and then flattened it. Now unfortunately I had to cut off more material than I wanted to in the flattening process but in hindsight it was actually a good thing because I ended up with a much lighter looking table that was a bit more elegant so i'm actually happy that i ended up at uh, i think it was around 22 mil instead of the 28 or 30 mil that i was shooting for the next job was to get a pattern that i could follow to cut the curves on the inside pieces so i wanted this as precise as possible so for that i went to my good friend scott's place from for me industrious and he cut a perfect curve on his cnc machine so once again, a very big thank you to Scott from For Me Industrious for uh, doing this cutout for me. Now I've got to take this and draw this curve and cut this curve out on this Morton Bay ash. 
Then I could use the band saw to cut up to the line, not on it, but up to it. And then I could thickness the boards down so they were both the same size. What I'm doing here is trying to remove as much material as I can before I do the pattern cut. You'll also notice that I'm using my drum sander here. I got this tool specifically for Morton Bay Ash because it is impossible to run this through my thicknesser without getting chip out. Being my first time using a pattern bit, obviously I've still got a lot to learn and the tear out on this is, well, it, it, let's just say that's a testament to it. I know one of the things I've done wrong is I'm essentially climbing up the grain, which is gonna be pulling it out. There's not too much I could do. Other thing that I could do, I guess, would be to switch to a, um, an up or down cut bit or compression bit. This was just a straight bit, so that's probably making it a bit worse. But that's okay, this is the underside, so it's not the end of the world. Once I've glued it together, you won't even see this. Okay, so now that the curves are cut on the center pieces, the next thing is to start gluing the steam bent strips onto those. Now, depending on how they've sprung back, it's gonna determine where in that line they're going to get attached. So, so I've got all of them here ready to go. I've drawn some lines on my workbench to help me grade their spring back, how much they've sprung back. That way I can sort them into some piles and that's gonna determine which ones get glued onto the inner radius first. I glued each strip individually, giving the glue around two hours to set up. And then almost immediately after saying five clamps is enough, <laughs> I've had to throw on one, two, three extras uh, just to pull in some of the gap. That's all right. And then 10 strips later, I ended up with one half of the table, flipping it up now. And then you can see what I'm working with. So this is essentially one half of the blank. I could then repeat the process again. You can see I'm using that backer piece with the correct curve. I'm so happy I saved that from one of the cuts. And then I could go through the same clamping process. Here you can see the order that I would add the clamps. So starting in the center and working my way out. And then finally on the last strip, I would glue in this dowel. This was just to hold the strips in place while I was working with them. That last strip would have had a tendency to want to pop out. Once both the halves were dry, I then brought them together, put some glue on the inside, added some of these coils just to keep them as flat as possible, and then added one clamp in the middle. The way I planned the edges for this join, and I can't remember the name off the top of my head, was to create a side gap in the middle so that as you pull that middle in, it forced the edges, the outside edges, really tight. And so it creates a very strong glue join. Then I could find the center of my new blank and using a very <laughs> rudimentary compass, I could draw a circle that was bigger than my final dimension. My next step is gonna to be to flatten this. So I wanna cut off as much excess material as I can using my circular saw. This is another example where I'm making use of these window packers. I swear by these things, they are the handiest thing to have in the shop. I'm gonna be using these one and a half mil packers just to lift this side up ever so slightly. You can see I've got the line here for the final dimension of the table. So I'm gonna be cutting close to this line using a jigsaw. Once that's done, I'm gonna take this router base, attach it to this piece of wood, put a single pivot point on that end, and then I can rotate that around coming right up to the line doing the final cut. I found the center point and gave it a pivot and now I'm about to cut the final size of this round table. I've never used this method before, but can I just say, this is one of the most satisfying processes you'll ever do. I'm using a down cut spiral bit here, which went a long way to make this a very clean cut. And you'll notice that I stopped just short of the bottom because I didn't want to blow out those fibers. 
Okay, so the tabletop is done. It's sitting over there. We're going to get to that a little bit later. The next job is to work on the legs. And for that, I'm going to be using this Vic Ash. They come out of these wider boards quite nicely with very little waste. Because I'm cutting up wide boards though, I'm going to cut the rough shape of the legs out of these boards and then leave it for a couple of days. That way if there's any tension, it can um, move and twist as it wants. And then from there, I can either flatten it again or put the piece aside and cut something else. So with all of the boards looking pretty stable at this point, I started the milling process. Just a lot of milling, 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 some jointing, some thicknessing, getting everything down to the size I wanted. After that, I could cut a 12 degree angle on both ends of the board and then get started on the mortise. To get rid of the majority of the material, I used a drill press with, I think this is an 18 mil spade bit. And then I could come back with my router and cut the inside of the mortars. This gives you a very, very clean internal face. And I'm at the point where I need to start making some cuts based on some measurements, which is what I'm doing now. This whole round dining table leg assembly is something I've never done before and it is, whew, yeah, there's a lot more to it than I thought. There's two possibilities that you can go. The one is to bring the legs right into the middle. That way you have a large overhang. But the problem with this is that your knees then have the tendency to hit these legs. So the, the other option is to then pull them further out, further out. You now lose that overhang of the table, but you can get your legs through. The issue here is you need to make sure that these are wide enough now for your thighs to slip through. Now that I decided how long I wanted the rails to be, I could create this small jig with a 12 degree angle on it that I was gonna to use to cut the tenons. I'm cutting the tenons using a router, so this jig is gonna be the fence that I run it against, and this is gonna allow me to get that 12 degree angle consistently. Now that I've made this first cut, I can take my combination square, set that between this edge, this cut edge and the fence. And now this will be how I set this fence for the rest of the cut. So as long as I keep this combination square set, then my fence will always be the same distance between this edge and this edge. So my shoulder will always be in the correct place. So with a bit of finessing with the chisel, I got the fit to where I wanted it. You can see the rail goes in and then I can lift the other piece up. That's pretty good. Next up was the half lap join in the middle where the two rails were going to cross. I started by cutting with a handsaw and a bandsaw just to get rid of the majority of the material. And yes, then it's back to the router to finish up that inside edge. Then I did a lot of sanding of all the parts. Okay, that's enough sanding. And then I could get onto the glue up. I glued up the two halves of the leg assembly separately. And what's nice is because of these angled tenons, you could just put the clamp on, cinch it together, and then it would automatically get the legs into that correct angle, into the correct position. And then with the two halves all glued up, I could glue them together in the middle with that half lap join. I've created another half lap join, similar to the first one. It's oversized, 
So now I can think about cutting it back in and deciding how far inside of the edge of this table I want it to be. Now the way I'm going to attach this top piece to the legs is with some dowels running through. So what I could do is on the drill press, drill through with a six millimeter drill bit, then line up this cross piece onto the legs and then come through again with a bigger bit, an eight millimeter bit, and then that would run through into the legs. So it's going to be perfectly lined up. And the reason I started with a six millimeter bit is I find if you run a drill bit through a hole multiple times with your final bit, that's going to expand it. So saving that eight millimeter bit for the final step and only drilling through once meant the fit would be a lot tighter. All right, just one more thing to do. I'm so close to finishing this now. I am so pumped. This cross piece has to be dialed in place in each one of the legs. And I'm gonna glue this half lap joint in the center at the same time. To finish, I'm gonna be using a hard wax oil. Now this is something that I haven't tried before, but there's so many people using it at the moment and it seems like such a fantastic product. I thought I'd give it a go. So I've got these two sample pots here from Whittle Waxes. I've got a satin and a matte. Now I've gotta be honest, when they sent me these little bottles, I thought, well, this is fantastic, but I'm not really gonna get very far with these. But I've finished the underside of the, the top already and I've only scratched the surface of this tub. It's amazing how far it goes. So I've got these two bottles. I'm gonna be using the matte as the first coat and then I'll switch to the satin after that because that's where I wanna finish. And I'll probably do three coats, uh, but I, I don't know. I've never used this tub before, so I'll, I'll see how this goes. Then everything got a light sand with 400 grit paper and I tried doing the final coat with that pad that you saw me using earlier, but it just ended up very blotchy and inconsistent. So then I switched to the roller and I got a much better finish. Then I could bring all the pieces upstairs and attach the top to the base using some figure eight clips. I'm attaching everything on this island bench that I built a couple months ago. There'll be a link in the corner to that video if you're interested in seeing how I made that. So this turned out to be more of a journey than a project. It literally took months to build just because of external factors, but I finally got here and I am so pumped with the end result. There's a lot of stuff that I've learned along the way. If I was to do this again, I would do certain things differently, but the overall result, definitely happy with it. So if you like this video, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up. And if you enjoy these types of videos and want to stay up to date with the content that I put out, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe. My name is Robin Lewis. Thanks again, and I will see you guys in the next video. So that was the last piece I've used the steam bending technique on, but I'm sure I will get back to it in the future. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave them down in the comments below. I'd be happy to answer them. My name is Robin Lewis. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.